Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to the Honest Youth Pastor YouTube channel, the channel that helps believers use biblical discernment in all aspects of life. Hey, I bet I know why you're here. All right, so I want to make sure that we cover the general gist of the whole Driscoll Lindell situation, just in case you don't know. I am assuming you know, but I don't want to assume too much because there's a lot of the story here. Now, I don't want to focus on too much of the drama between them. I think what the drama between them and the entire situation that went down um, has been covered. <laughs> you don't, you do not have to search very long on YouTube to see a lot of, I mean, I am one, I am a drop in the bucket of a lot of videos that are talking about this situation right here. But I do want to at least know, uh, kind of give us a 3,000 foot view of what has happened so that we at least can learn from it. That's the goal here, right? This entire channel exists to help believers use biblical discernment in all aspects of life. So how can we, as believers, use biblical discernment when we're addressing something of this size, right? A lot of people have heard about this. Um, unbelievers that I know have heard about this. And so our goal is to hopefully learn from it. What, what does the Bible say? We're going to go over um, five verses uh, or five sections of scripture, hopefully by the end of this, that we can say, okay, well, what can we, what can we learn from this so that this doesn't necessarily happen to us? So maybe on a smaller, on a smaller scale. So there are links in the description of all the videos that I'm aware of that cover a pretty good timeline of what's going on. Those are in the description below. The first one is of, let me see here. Let me go over to this screen. Here we go. We're not going to watch these. Honestly, if this was my full-time job, if YouTube was my job, it'd be like a five-hour live stream bonanza where we would walk through each of these. We don't have time for that, so I'm going to have to give you the 3,000-foot view. This, The first link that you have down there is basically a video of Mark giving his little thing and then um, getting kicked off of the stage. That's what the first link is. That's what it is here. That was about five minutes long, just short of it. Okay, so Mark gets up, does his thing, talks about the Jezebel spirit uh, being at the conference because, you know, the, the sword, the sword swallowing guy did his thing. Now, the second video is a Facebook video. These are all over the place, guys. <laughs> like it's Facebook, YouTube, all over the place. This one is 31 minutes. Now, if you haven't seen it, I know you've probably seen clips of it. You've probably definitely seen the clip where um, John is sitting there and basically says, the clip that I've seen go around a lot is John basically telling people, hey, don't question or critique God's anointed because it leads to unbelief, which I don't have a thousand hours to do videos. I'd like to do a video on that. It's That is a gaslighting tactic, 100%. It's very not, it's, it's, it's bad. But if you watch this video, Mark is a lot more restrained. He cries at the beginning of it. Like, so Mark gets up. He doesn't rebuke anybody. He just makes an observation, he says, about the conference and about the Jezebel spirit. John Lindell gets up, tells him he's out of line. Mark storms off the stage. Lindell gets up. The crowd is clearly on Mark's side. And he basically uses his dad voice and tells him that Mark was out of line. It's a Matthew 18 thing. And we'll cover that here in a minute. And then apparently, according to this video, which is long and weird, but it's 40 minutes long, John takes a Wednesday night, apparently, to address a timeline of events. So according to John, Mark gets up, says his thing. He gets up and tells him he's out of line. He goes out to the parking lot. He says he goes out to the parking lot to catch Mark because apparently Mark was on his way to the airport. Mark gets told that he's out of line. He says, I received that. He walks off the stage. John gets up, tries to calm the crowd down because they're all upset. Apparently, John then brings the worship team up. From my understanding, they start playing. John goes to chase Mark down. Mark is already in the parking lot because he's heading toward the, uh, the airport to go home. And John and him have this conversation. Now, in the video, this one right here, right here, John says that they post a picture together. Right? They have this conversation in the parking lot where Mark's like, hey, that didn't go like I thought it would go. And John goes, you're out of line. Mark disagrees with him. And they have this conversation about, hey, I still want to be your friend. And I still think you should stay. And he's like, well, we should. John says, we should post a picture together. 
Now, if that doesn't scream like everything that's wrong with celebrity pastors, that I don't know what does. This idea that this all went down and the th thought that comes into your brain is that we should sh we should take a picture together and post it. He says in that video where he uh, basically calls Mark Driscoll to repentance um, that Mark insisted that Mark be the one that post it. Again, this is all like, what are you doing? You There's this whole blow up on stage and now you're wanting to post pictures to social media to show your buddies. What, it's weird. Then, John says, they come back on stage, which is this video, and um, they have a talking session for 30 minutes, which is just awkward and weird. Mark is a lot more subdued. He doesn't really push the idea of the Jezebel spirit so much. He kind of asks John what his thoughts are on it, and John deflects a little bit. It's weird. It's a weird video. There were a lot of people praising this video because the idea was that John and Mark reconciled on the stage, which, I don't know, you watch it. That's why I provided you the link. I don't think that's what happens. I think it's sort of a Mark is very much subdued and basically like letting John do the talking because he, he at least puts off the air that um, John is his spiritual authority and he's just going to let him talk and not really say a lot. The crowd, though, if you watch this, is still on Mark Driscoll's side. They're very much on, like, John is, even though it's his church, is playing defense in this video. And so that's where we go. Apparently, in this video here, if you watch the whole thing, Mark Driscoll flies back to Arizona. He uh, gets off the plane. He obviously sees on the internet where there's this whole firestorm of controversy about this video and this video. And he tells John, apparently, hey, John. I'm just not going to be on the internet. I'm just going to be in prayer. And then John goes through, and I'd encourage you to watch this one. It's weird, but John goes through where Mark basically over the next day starts texting his sons, starts trying to sow division, starts, uh, John basically accuses uh, Mark of leaking information about Alex, the sword swallower. And um, it just, it's, it's weird. So at the end of the video, John basically calls Mark. This was Wednesday that this video you see on the screen is there. He calls John to, uh, or he calls Mark to repent for spreading lies about Alex, which we'll get to Alex in a minute. He calls him to repent for sowing division in the church and in John's family. And then he says that he's alerted and uh, two other pastors or one other pastor has talked to Mark uh, one of the pastors that helped restore Mark back into ministry, um, and that Mark has told that guy that he's he's not he's he wants to be friends with John and he loves John, but that's all he says. He doesn't repent. And so at the end of this video, John basically tells all of his church that if Mark doesn't respond in repentance, that they are to act as if he is a non-believer, which is strong. Now that's the whole story, right? It's a lot bigger than it ever needed to be, and I think we can learn a lot from it. Now, before we get into the verses, though, there are two video, or there's two things I want to show you. The first is Protestia um, put this article out. Uh, it's got a response from Alex here at the bottom um, of Alex basically saying he's a Christian and yada, 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 and Mark completely misshoot his stuff. There's another video I've also linked below which is this video that he posted um, nine hours ago from me doing this video where he basically walks through and talks about his faith. I would, I would encourage you to watch it only because I think it, it's, he, he says he's an Orthodox Christian. He's been an Orthodox Christian since birth. He um, like explains what that means to him. Um, yeah, basically all you need to know, there's a comment on here. Uh, let me see if it's one of them here. No. Uh, I don't know. There's there's a comment on here where he basically said God is one for everyone or something. And you'll have to go through the comments. I can't find it. I thought it was the pinned one. It's not. The point is, it's, this video makes me call into question his understanding of the gospel. That's all I'm going to say. This video is not about that, but those links are for you. So there's that. Okay. So we have that. Now that's the big controversy. Honestly, all of this <laughs> could have been avoided if, um, so this is what probably would have happened. 
Mark Driscoll would have done Mark Driscoll things, got up and said something about the spirit of Je uh, Jezebel, the spirit of Ahab, the spirit of Elijah, and said what he says a thousand times. The one link I forgot to include that I'll include later is the sermon that he preached at his church when he got back this last this last Sunday, is that Mark Driscoll would have just done Mark Driscoll things and talked about the spirit of Jezebel. I mean, if you don't know, Mark Driscoll runs with Greg Locke and the Demon Slayers, Isaiah Saldivar, those guys. I mean... So the idea that he's talking about the spirit of Jezebel and is wrote a whole book. Now, th I do want to say that that book that um, people are saying that this was a whole promo stunt, whatever, that came out in um, 7 of 23. So it's been out for a while. Like, it's been released for a while. So it's not like this is a new book that he's trying to promote and create a whole controversy. The book's been out for a long time. Just nobody cares. And um, now he's giving it out for free because of the whole thing, which is a very common thing. Canon Press does that a lot. Whenever they have controversy, they give out their books for free or at a discount. It's, it's free marketing is what he's utilizing it for. But I don't think that's why he did it. <clears throat> so anyway, this whole thing could have been prevented if Mark Driscoll would have just got up and said Mark Driscoll things. John would have just sat there and not said anything. And really all that would have happened is that maybe a clip or two of Mark saying something about the spirit of Jezebel would have went around, right? Protesty probably would have put a clip out about it. A couple of people would have made videos about it and it would have been over because it's just Mark Driscoll being Mark Driscoll now. That's all. It's just, that's what he does now. John getting up and telling Mark he's out of line and Mark going off of stage and then John getting up and making a whole thing about Matthew 18 about it blew it up even more okay so now we're past just making a clip about it now we're, we're we're in a day in christian news about it but the fact that they came back out and talked about it now we're talking about it more then john getting up and giving an entire 38 minute like talk about it on a wednesday uh, in which he like releases he spills the tea on text messages and stuff um, has made it a huge story and as I put on Twitter the other day, I think this whole situation is a shame on the church on how believers are, are supposed to interact with one another. There are disagreements that can be had um, in which you don't have to <laughs> act like children. Um, go, like, right? The mature thing to do is if you're up there and Mike or John yells at you and says, hey, you're out of line. Okay, awkward for sure. No question, a little cringe. But you just keep going with your message. You don't go to the parking lot and head for the airport. That's a weird move. It's a weird move too to bring him back out after posting a staged photo that you're all buddy-buddy and try to make it look like you're fine now. It's super strange that you release all the text messages, even though if the text messages are true, they're very, they're bad, they're, like, they're terrible. So what can we learn from it, right? That's the whole point. We've talked for um, we've talked for going on 17 minutes about this entire thing. So here, here's what we're going on. We're gonna we're gonna go through a couple of verses, right? And ironically, um, <laughs> uh, Brian here just posted the first one. We're gonna go over. So let's pull it up. We got First Timothy um, chapter five, verses 20 and 21, right? That's what we're looking at now. Here's the thing, though. We got to obviously read, as always, um, a little bit of the context of what's going on, which was going to start at verse 17. So we'll just read that all the way through to the end of the chapter, and then we'll talk about it. Because this one keeps coming up, is that uh, Mark openly rebuked John, and therefore that's the way we're supposed to do it. Well, let, let's look. Verse 17 of 1 Timothy chapter 5. Let the elder who rule be... Uh, considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. That's pulling from the Old Testament. And then here's verse 20. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ and the, uh, of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without uh, prejudging. Do nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor uh, take part in the sins of others. 
keep yourselves pure, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and uh, your frequent ailments. The sins of some people are uh, conspiracy going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So all, always, sorry, so also good works uh, are conspicuous and even those that are not can uh, not remain hidden. Now, the two verses that people keep bringing up are verses 20 and 21. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear, right? That, that's the defense that people are using for, hey, look, Mark did what Mark was supposed to do. He, he rebuked them in the presence of all. We're, we're sort of missing the point here, though, I think, is that as believers, we are in a, uh, a community of, of, of believers. You're supposed to be in a local gathering of believers. You have local believers. Now, Timothy, when Paul writes to Timothy, there's a lot of elder talk. We're actually going to get to the qualifications here in a minute, but he's talking about let the elders who rule be uh, well, be well, be considered of double honor, especially those who labor and preach and teaching. So we're talking about elders here. We're talking about elders according to verse 20, as for those who persist in sin, right? This idea of persisting in sin is that it is ongoing. It, it is something that has been addressed, but is continually happening. And so if you want to use this argument for Mark rebuking John, fine. But aside from the fact that that's not what Mark does, Mark rightly, I think, calls out the idea that there are, there's entertainment at a Christian conference that shouldn't be there. Now, I'm definitely not on the same page with Mark that it's the spirit of Jezebel and yada, yada, yada. But there, there is a holiness and a reverence that's supposed to be in the gathering of believers. Now, it's not a local church. This is a conference of local men. But the, how, how, why should that change anything? Right? Nobody's, nobody is calling out verses 20 and 21 when John is out here with boxers in a ring. No one's calling out John... Uh, for persistent sin whenever there's tanks being rolled across the stage for entertainment. No one's calling out John for pyrotechnics and fireworks for entertainment purposes either. Nobody, Nobody's saying anything about that. So verse 20, as for those who persist in sin, this is an ongoing persistent thing. There's also this idea that this is local elders, right? We're going to get into that here in a minute. But this idea that we have churches such as Mark's, that are independent. Yes, they have local elders, a local elder structure, but no one's really like, there's no bishops above them, right? In an actual sense of what actually happens, uh, as we see in the, in, in the New Testament. But there's supposed to be some sort of oversight here, so that if there is a persisting in sin, it will be dealt with. Right? That's when you rebuke them in the presence of all, when there is a persistent, ongoing sin that has not been dealt with. And you only do it, right? Let's, let's pull this back up. You only do it, verse 19, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Then, right, if that evidence is, is brought and the sin persists, then you rebuke them. Then you rebuke them. Now, here's the thing. If you want to flip it, and say, well, this is John, when John is in front of his entire congregation, this is what he's doing in regards toward Mark. Well, first of all, John, if you go watch that video, uh, let me see this one right here. He only names one other person that he's talked to that ha he had call Mark and talk to Mark about what Mark did. Just one. He names other people that help restore, quote unquote, Mark into ministry, but we don't know if any of them talk to them. So this whole rebuke him in front of all, right? So here's the serious thing, right? I think what this brings to the surface is the reality that I don't know is if we as believers are real firm on being consistent in how we execute or even understand church discipline. One of the things I think this can teach us is that one, if we are going to bring a charge against someone, a, a charge of sin, okay? And you have to understand, that's serious. 
If you're bringing a charge against someone, somebody that you're saying this person is an open rebellion toward God, yet says they're a believer, in this case, in Timothy, they're an elder that you're bringing sin in front of, that they are, you have some evidence of two or three witnesses to do that. Not only do you have evidence of two or three witnesses, there's the caveat in verse 20 that this is a persistent thing. The fact that anybody, you, me, John, anybody, can fast track church discipline that happened on a Saturday for a Wednesday is kind of crazy. Okay? The fact that we want to we want to do that really fast is sort of nutty. And so what we have is this idea that there's this persistent sin that occurs. And so if we want to use this 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse, which I've seen used a lot in comments, a lot in my DMs, all that sort of stuff, if we want to use that, we have to use it correctly, right? So there's an elder that has witnesses that can be brought before them of their sin, and it's persistent, so they've been, they've been aware of it, and now there's time for uh, repentance to occur to, to show that they are repentant. But in this case in Timothy, we have a persistent sin. And so what we have, whether it be Mark or John, you or I, if we're going to use this verse, there is a time in which we're giving, um, let's pull this back up. We're giving some time here in verse 20 that is persistent. And then we rebuke them in the presence. For what reason? so that the rest may stand in fear. Now, what's that mean? Well, here's the point. The reason it's even brought up is because sin separates us from God. And so if we are saying we are a believer, yet we're an open rebellion toward God, and it is persistent, even though it has been brought to our attention, and yet we still keep doing it, we rebuke that person in front of the local body. Why? So that those in the presence can fear, right? So the rest may stand in fear. Fear of what? Fear, one, of God's uh, condemnation on that person, but fear that sin, that that can even happen to a believer. That you, that you, you would be so, so prideful as to not repent but yet be persistent in your sin. That's the first thing we're going to look at, right? That's the first verse. Somebody else mentions the uh, Paul rebuking Peter thing. Uh, I don't have that one pulled up, but we may pull that up if we have time. I have to, I have a pretty short amount of time, but I think we should have time. We'll get that. So the second one uh, that I want to look at is, let's see, let's go to Titus. Because this is the thing. We talk a lot about qualification for elders. Okay. Elders being pastors in the church. Now, to be frank, I think you've all probably heard this before. Really, the qualifications for elder are, are, should be the, the aim that every believer aims for. Okay. Now, obviously not every believer is going to be an elder. There's, there's a lot of reasons that not every believer can be an elder, but the idea is that we shoot for that. Okay. So let's go to this first, the ones in Timothy or Titus, rather Titus starting at verse five says this, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you may put what remained in order and appoint elders, multiple elders, multiple elders, not just one, in every town as I directed you. So here are the qualifications. If anybody is above reproach, a husband of one wife and his children are believers and not not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent, or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, and also rebuke those who contradict it. Now, there's a lot of people that will often say, well, how in the world are we ever supposed to have elders? Like, how can you expect that of anybody? Well, first of all, every Christian should should aim for those things to be true of you, right? You should aim for the idea that your children are believers, you're faithful, right? 
you're above reproach. You're not arrogant. You're not quick-tempered. You're not drunkard. You're not violent. You're not greedy. But you are hospitable. You are a lover of good. You are self-controlled. You are upright. You are holy. You are disciplined. Right? These are things that every believer should aim for. Now, can I be frank really quick? I know this video isn't necessarily exactly about Mark or John, but there are some things in that list that if you watch those videos, there's some things that pop out here. Arrogance, quick temperedness, right? There are some things that we have to go, I'm not saying you're disqualified. I'm just saying if these keep happening, that's an issue. This is also why when he talks back in Timothy, you shouldn't be quick to lay on hands, right? You should not be quick to, to, to bring men up into the pastorate that maybe don't fit these qualifications. Maybe they are really charismatic. Maybe they have, they can speak like nobody's business. They are very, they draw people to themselves. They say all the right things at the right time. Great. Fantastic. Do they meet these qualifications though? Because you have a lot of people that can say the right things and say them very loudly and say them very authoritatively. Do they possess these qualifications? Now, 1 Timothy chapter 3 is the second place that these are mentioned. These are qualifications, again, for an overseer. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, it says, And the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-control, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well and with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own house, how will he care for the house of God? Verse 6 is often overlooked. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into con the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that uh, he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. Again, these are all things that believers, right, as believers, we should aspire toward, <laughs> right? You should be sober-minded, self-control, respectable, hospitable, there should be some aspect of, as a believer, that you can teach the word. Maybe not in front of a lot of people, but you are, you're going to teach the word to somebody, right? You are, you are making disciples. And so what we have here, and I think, again, what we can learn from this situation is that we really need to be far more concentrated on our, is our behavior in line with what it says, especially as pastors, we should be doing. Now, does that mean, right, pastors don't call out blatantly, um, blatantly troubling things um, wherever they see them? No, that doesn't. Of course, you, you call that out. I mean, you, you have, you have uh, I think it was Timothy, Timothy or Titus. One of the two gets literally murked because they uh, they get killed. That's what I mean by murked. <laughs> Try not to upset the algorithm, but who cares? They get killed by the worshipers of Athena because they stop. They're trying to stop a parade, right? They're calling they're calling Athena out as a, a, as a, a demon, as a false god, and they get killed. That's at least church history says so. And so, of course, pastors are to call out sin. That does not mean right? That we, we just sit idly by whenever we see something that shouldn't be there, right? I agree that Mark Driscoll rightly said something about just pointless entertainment at a men's conference. Again, I don't, I think the Jezebel spirit thing, that's a theological difference uh, that I have with him. But the point being, where were all the strong voices um, calling out boxing at a conference that's supposed to make stronger men? What does boxing have to do with Christian masculinity? I don't know. I mean, we see we see in Ephesians, Paul pretty much describes how a man should be in his marriage, right? 
Where was it when the tank was rolling through the, uh, you know, rolling over cars? Again, I'm not saying equating one to the other. I'm just saying, where are all the strong voices calling out John for the nonsense all up until there? So we have these texts. Now, John brings up in this video right here, as well as this video when he calls Mark out and tells him he's out of line. He talks about it here. He doubles downs on it here. He talks about Matthew 18. Okay. Now, this is the classic, if your brother sins against you, this is um, the church discipline that Paul later in Corinthians um, kind of works out more and, and has an example for that whenever um, he writes to the Corinthians. But the idea and the basis of church discipline starts here at Jesus's words. And John comes out and says that, and this is what he uses in order to uh, do his whole video on calling Mark to repentance and then calling Mark an unbeliever if he doesn't repent. And so what we have here is Jesus' words. We'll just read them. I know you're familiar with them now. Literally probably every video you've watched about Mark Driscoll or John has talked about this. We're going to read it again. Matthew 18, starting at verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Right. So th this is the verse that John says, hey, Mark should have talked to me before he started saying that. Now, let me say this real quick. Okay. If you are a pastor, if you have invited people to speak at your church, if you are somebody that has spoken at other churches, it has been a very rare occasion in which I am asked to speak at another church that they don't ask me what I'm talking about and maybe ask for an outline. The idea that you would go to a conference, show up, and then 20 minutes before you go on, the person that's hosting the conference goes, hey, bro, what you talking about? Are you kidding me? You have thousands of people out there and you're just releasing this dude on them without having any clue what he's talking about. And you're the one that's running this. And you're the one that's responsible for the things that come out of this person's mouth and what happens and what is said. Like you, we could, all of that could have been prevented. If we had an outline of what you were going to talk about beforehand and know what's going on, not like a word for word, just like, Hey, what is a general, what are the general statements you're making? I'm just telling you, if you ever preach at a church they should ask you what you're talking about before you get up and start preaching. I mean, shame on them if they don't, right? Who knows what's going to come out of this? I mean, I don't care if you trust this brother or not. The idea is that you're responsible for putting this person in front of your people. What is he going to say? Anyway, so John tells Mark that he should have talked to him beforehand. If he had an issue with this, he should have talked to him beforehand. Now, here's something that I think... Um, Jesus is talking within the context, obviously it's the Jewish context of the synagogue. Paul later transfers that into the context of the, the local body and the local church. But this idea that if you are in community with people and they sin against you, you are going to go tell them that they did and you're going to resolve it because that's the mature adult thing to do. Okay. And so the idea is this is what Jesus is saying. Hey, if, if your brother, if somebody you are in a faith community with sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Now, th this is not what happens at all at the conference, right? This is not, it is not a personal thing that Mark had against John. In fact, Mark prefaces the whole thing with, I'm not calling out or rebuking anybody. I'm making an observation. John seems to, and I think this is a good lesson for us too, seems to get all up in his feelings about the fact that Mark is calling out uh, something that John probably had to sign off on and in calling it out is making John look bad. And I, that seems to be what happens. And be honest with you, I, I've seen that happen in a much smaller scale in different ministries and churches, is that somebody gets their feelings hurt or feels like their authority has been stepped on because they haven't vetted what's being said beforehand, and then emotions take over, and reason doesn't isn't driving the seat. Maturity isn't driving the seat. The the, the qualifications for that we looked at in pastor, right? That's not driving. The emotions are. And then what we see happen with this whole situation happens. Because we weren't, we, we didn't have the forethought to exercise the things that the scriptures call us to be. 
And so anyway, this whole idea here is very much a local community, not at all what happens at the conference. However, Jesus goes on to say, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. So, hey, if your brother sins against you, this is good in a local context. There are people in your local church that are going to say something uh, that makes you mad, that, that are going to sin against you, that are going to do something. Look, hey, ignore the whole Mark Driscoll, John Lindell thing. This is applicable to us. If you are in a local community, somebody you're in community with is going to do something to you. You are probably going to do something to them. You're going to say something, do something, act a type of way, not even thinking about it, and they're going to be super offended about it, or they're, they're going to feel sinned against. And so Jesus is so gracious to give us, this is what you do in this circumstance. You don't avoid it. You don't ignore it. You don't build up hatred against them. You go to them and you say, hey, you've sinned against me, and then you work it out. That, that's what you do. He says, if they listen to you, you gained a brother, right? If you go to them and they acknowledge, yeah, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. It was, it was my bad. You've gained a brother. If somebody comes to you, have the humility to say you're right, right? Like I, I was, I was having a bad day. I was in a bad mood. Doesn't excuse it, but that's like, that was my headspace. I'm sorry. And you're reconciled. Is that not the beautiful news of the gospel that not only are we reconciled to God the Father through Jesus Christ, but that enables us to be reconciled with our brothers and sisters as well. Because we know what we've been forgiven of, and therefore we forgive others. It's the gospel. But, it says in verse 16, If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Now, not only is Jesus pulling from the Old Testament, this right here removes your bias. Let's say in this situation with Mark and John, right? John doesn't say anything. He lets Mark do his thing. Afterwards, he goes up to Mark and says, hey, Mark, like, I feel like you were way out of line there. I feel like this could have been addressed differently. And Mark says, no, nah, I think I did it right. So then John goes and gets two or three other pastors of that church that were there that saw it happen, and he brings them along. Those two or three witnesses are going to be able to, to mediate and either say, you know, Mark, I think, I think John's right, but John, I think maybe you probably were in your feelings a little too much about it, but you're not wrong. It's just, I think you're taking it too personally. Mark did do it wrong, but I think you're, you're being a little too emotional about it. Those two or three witnesses are there for a reason. What? It says to establish every charge. You're not always going to, you're not going to be right sometimes about somebody sinning against you. Or maybe you are right and you've went too far. Or maybe you're right and you didn't go far enough. Two or three witnesses are there to help establish the charges. Why? To de-escalate the situation. We did not need to get to this point with Mark and John being the news of the internet, Christian and not. Again, it is a shame on the church that this even had to, ha that this got this far, guys. Jesus gives us exactly what to do. Now, again, I disagree with John that this like this necessarily applies to this particular situation, but if we're going to work it out as if it does, it still works. We could have avoided all of it because that sit down session they have is not this. It's not, it, this, this is not that it's not Matthew 18 at all. Anyway, moving on verse 17. So you've been sinned against. The evidence has been brought. Two or three people have come. They have actually sinned against you. If he then refuses to listen to them, then tell the church. Do you know how long it takes to actually do this process in real life? A while. It takes a while. Why? Because people are complicated. Situations are a lot more complex. We get in our feelings a whole lot more than we like to admit. This takes a minute. But... If these witnesses have said, hey, no, you're right, you all go to this person, this person refuses to repent, then you bring it to the church. The church being the local body of believers that you're both a part of. Because that local body knows you both. It's basically the two witnesses amplified. The hope being that the local body has both of your 
your your good in mind. They want to see you reconciled. They want to see you both uh, forgive one another. They want to see repentance had. Is that not the purpose of the local church that you go to? You don't want the good for your fellow believer in the local church. So when something is disrupted, that's not enjoyable for anybody. Like, let's figure this out. Let's open the Bible. Let's hash this out. Let's see what the scriptures say. So you go to the church, and if he refuses to listen to even the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Let me plainly say this. If you go watch John's video calling out Mark Driscoll, calling him to repentance, it is 100% not at all the way to execute Matthew 18. I did a sermon review on John a long time ago. That sermon was pretty good. Uh, the, I don't even know what text he covered, but it was, it was pretty legit. This here, his application of Matthew 18 is terrible. He does not get to call his church to excommunicate Driscoll from a local body he was never a part of. It also completely misses the point of 18. Mark is not in community with these people. He's a, a fellow believer with these people, yes, but he's not in community with them. If you understand the culture that Jesus is speaking into and that Paul is speaking into that then develops into the early church, the idea, real quick, let's just do a breakdown. I got about 20 minutes left. The local body, you are brought in via belief, confession, and baptism. After confession and baptism, you are part of the local body. After that, you are able to uh, participate in the table, communion. You're able to uh, the, do the, the remembrance of uh, Jesus' body broken, his blood shed, the remembrance of that for the remission of your sins because you're part of that local body. If church discipline does take place and it gets all the way to the point to where you won't even listen to the church and it says, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector and you're cast out, you're cast out from, you're not able to take communion anymore. Because your refusal to repent from sin has put you outside of the church. The body of believers. The blood-bought family of God. You've put yourself out. The church is just acknowledging what you've already said you want. Which is you love your sin more than you love Jesus. They're just acknowledging that and cutting you off from communion and the body. That is not a fun enjoyable, happy time for anybody. And so there are certain steps that Jesus himself lays out here for what that looks like, for the hope that that won't get that far. So there's that. That's Matthew 18. John Lindell <laughs> um, is a we won't get into what I think about his theology or him, but let's say for the sake of argument, he's a qualified elder. He is, if he's a qualified elder, he's a qualified elder over his people. He is supposed to shepherd them well. He is supposed to teach them the gospel. He is supposed to disciple them and have people in the church making disciples, mentoring Titus two. He's supposed to, he's supposed to foster a Titus two uh, ministry. The, the, this church discipline isn't fun, but he doesn't get to do it to Mark just because he's mad at Mark. Anyway, let's go on to this next one. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And this is where Paul actually uh, gives an example of what, what this looks like. Now, Paul is writing, obviously, to the Church of Corinth. In this particular example, you've probably heard it before, there is a, uh, there's some sexual immorality happening. We're just going to read it really quick. Uh, verse 1 in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you of a kind that is not even tolerated among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant again. This is this arrogant, this refusal to repent doesn't have to have to always have to do with sexual sin. This is the particular sin that Paul is dealing with, but there's a lot of sins that people are arrogant about. Ought you not rather mourn, right? There should be, Paul, Paul when writing to them, he goes, this should make you sad. This should make you weep. Why are you not weeping over unrepentant sin in your local body? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. 
right? This idea that he's being removed, why? Because he's unrepentant. He doesn't care. He's been approached. He said, so what? Then Paul in verse 3, For though absent in the body, am I, I am present in the Spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my Spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. The idea of church discipline, the purpose of church discipline, is that it would bring somebody to the point of breaking to where they understand they do need Christ. There are people, right? This doesn't have anything to do with with Mark or John at this point. There are people that will be unrepentant and arrogant in their sin, and they will not realize that until they hit rock rock bottom, and that is unfortunate. I know a number of people that are either still heading toward rock bottom or have hit rock bottom and by God's grace have turned to him. Now it took some incredibly dark moments for that, for them to realize that. But if they had not been turned over, if they had just been coddled and told, no, you're a Christian and you can still do this. No, you're fine. Jesus loves you. You're, he's working on you. We're looking for progress, not perfection, right? Just keep trying. Like, they they did not they were not repentant they were arrogant if they hadn't been turned over they wouldn't have turned to Christ and this is Paul's point is that this man is arrogant not only is he arrogant the church is arrogant so he says turn him over why so that his soul may be saved now here's the last point and again I think this is more of a learning thing for us. This doesn't really have a lot to do with Mark or John, but it happens to keep going is uh, verse 9. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexual immoral people, not at all meaning the sexual immoral of this world or the greedy or the swindles or idolaters. Again, Paul is trying to make the point this is not just about sexual immorality. This is about all sin. Since then you would have to go out from the world But I am now writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual morality, greed, or idolatry, rival, drunkard, swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what do I have to do with judging outsiders? If it is not those inside the church whom we are to judge, God judges the outside, purge the evil person from among you. Again, Paul's point here is that, look, sinners are going to sin. That should not be a surprise. However, if someone says they are a Christian... Right? I don't care if they say they're Orthodox, if they're Catholic, if they're Protestant. I don't care if they say they are a follower of Jesus, but they participate in these things and will not repent from those things and are solid and arrogant in those things. He says, then you execute church discipline, which is the Matthew 18 thing. And you, you turn them over only as a last resort because they refuse to listen to you, two or three witnesses, the entire body of believers. And you do that for the purpose that they will turn to Christ. So the one thing we can learn, like from this whole situation, is that at the end of the day, if this particular situation between Mark and John had been handled in a Matthew 18 way, like John said he was wanting to do, it would have been handled different. If we as believers are going to handle things in a biblical way, we're going to actually need to do it in a biblical way. And that means time and patience and effort. That means involving the local church. That assumes that you are part of a local church. That assumes that your local church is operating in ways that the scriptures dictate that it should operate underqualified elders that meet certain qualifications. And why is it so important for them to meet those qualifications? Because they are going to have to deal with situations like this, and they are going to need to be level-headed, sober-minded, dignified, thought of well. They're going to need to be able to possess those qualities so as to lead the people well. And in this particular situation, John and Mark Both completely act like children and not like the pastors that they're called to be. I have my own thoughts about Mark Driscoll. I think I've been pretty clear about those. And I have my thoughts that are forming about John. And I think those have been pretty evident 
as I've talked through this. The point is, the qualifications are not a suggestion, and there's a reason they're not a suggestion. Because as pastors of local churches, there are real lives with real sin, with real implications that have to be dealt with in biblical ways. And that, as we've seen, can get real messy real quick if we don't do that right. Which just makes the outside world go, you guys are crazier than us. This looks like a Jerry Seinfeld, uh, not Seinfeld, not Jerry Seinfeld, Jerry Springer episode up in here between these two guys. One of them storming off stage. The other one's, you know, telling everybody about text messages. Come on, guys. Come on. Like, there are better ways to handle this as believers. It's not like we're out here guessing. We have scripture that walks us through it. All right, we got a couple minutes left. Let's go through the comments really quick. Um, somebody did um, mention the Paul confronts Peter situation. Let me pull that up really quick um, because I did say I wanted to. Um, I did say I wanted to look at that, so I want to make sure we actually do that. All right, so it's uh, Galatians chapter two, verse eleven, starting at verse eleven. It says this, Paul opposes Peter, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Why did he stand condemned? Well, we don't have to guess. Verse 12, for before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you be forced, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Now, I don't know the comment before. Let me see if I can find it about why that was even referenced. Um, he says, except when Peter rebuked or Paul rebuked Peter and did Mark specifically call out any specific person? That's somewhat implied. So yeah, his point here was that did Mark, maybe somebody said that Mark did this. Maybe Mark was being Paul to the Peter that John is, or John Lindell is. Well, that'd be false. If anybody draws that equivalency, that is a false equivalency. Because Mark was as soft as he possibly could be when addressing the thing that he addressed. And what I mean by that is that at the beginning, if you watch this video, this is this first one right here, if you watch this video, um, he, he gets on a knee and he's like, I'm not rebuking anybody or condemning anybody. I'm just making an observation. And if Mark is being Paul here, or if he has the spirit of Elijah, as he seems to claim in some of his sermons, then he wouldn't have been that timid. If he really thought that Jezebel, the spirit of Jezebel, had opened the conference not only would he have talked to John beforehand, but even if he didn't do that, he would have said, John, right? Here, he, he would have just done a blog post like this. He would have probably said, but when John came to, to the Stronger Men Conference, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men at the conference before uh, had come from other churches, well, John was eating with uh, the, the, you know, the entertainers, but when they came, he drew back and he just ate with the other pastors. Well, that's not quite the accurate thing, but you get my point. The idea is that he would have called out John specifically, and he doesn't do that. So what can we learn from this whole thing, right? We're wrapping it up here, unless there's some random comments that come in here. We can learn that there are times to call out sin when you see it. Unfortunately, and hopefully it won't happen often, but there may be sin that happens in, in your church that you need to call out and address. Obviously, Matthew 18, there's ways to do that. There's You go to that person. If the pastor is uh, specifically doing it, you, you go to him, and then hopefully you have an elder board, and you can go to them if he doesn't listen to you. And then the elder board, hopefully, are qualified men that aren't going to just take the pastor's side, um, and they'll look at it in a in a non-biased way. And maybe it doesn't come out the way you think and you submit to that. And maybe they do say, you know, you're right. Cause you, hopefully if you come to condemn someone, you have the receipts for that. 
right? You, you, you have your case or like, if you, let's just say you think your pastor's done something that needs called out. You don't just say, Hey, I think you did this wrong. You come with Bible verses. You come with examples of where he has wrong, uh, you know, sinned against those verses. This is the same way as if somebody get sinned against you, you come and say, Hey, you sinned against me according to this verse, yada, yada, yada. Right. I mean, you don't just say, Hey, I'm mad at you. So as believers, we exercise what the scriptures tells us. Actually, we submit to scripture and do things scripture's way. And we don't get up all in our feelings and get mad and be abrasive and send random text messages and like break down. We are stable minded people filled with the spirit, dealing with other believers in godly ways. And sometimes that does mean we use very strong, direct rebukes. But we don't come empty handed just because we think that we're right and they're wrong. We come with scripture like the Bereans. We check what they say against the scripture to verify the correctness or incorrectness of what they say. Simple as that. And we follow the biblical guidelines of how it's directed us to follow. And that requires, and here's the thing that like is missing from a lot of churches. It requires a structure, a church structure that is modeled after the New Testament structure of church which means there is membership. There, there is accountability. There are elders that are qualified. There are procedures in places to deal with things like that. Looks like last question here. We as believers don't practice church discipline at all. You'll be more likely to undergo church discipline for opposing uh, the installation of the fog machine than you will be for sleeping with your girlfriend. Um, if that's the case, if that's true, if there's a church that you go to like that, um, there's ways to address it, right? If you don't have a church in which you can take that exact complaint to your pastor and say, hey, I feel like we don't have a, a, a biblical church discipline structure here. Could you kind of walk me through maybe where I'm wrong? Like, do we? And I just don't know about it. Don't expect them to give you examples specifically with names, but hopefully there is a policy that they have that they can talk to you about in which that happens. Because here's the reality. If there's not, stuff like this whole Driscoll situation on a much smaller scale will occur. Because what we have now with Driscoll and Lindell is, um, is two grown men that will just say they're Christian I mean, I don't, I'm, they both say they are and are behaving in unchristlike ways, not just for believers. I mean, yeah, but definitely unchristlike ways as pastors, misapplying text, um, doing all sorts of things that like you wouldn't expect a Christian, let alone a pastor to do. So there's that. I think we've covered it all guys. There's a lot we can learn from this. And as always, it's just whenever we don't follow scripture, that's when we get in trouble every single time. Hey, if you got all the way to the end of this video, thank you very much. I appreciate you watching. I appreciate um, you taking the time to listen to me. There's a thousand videos out here about this and you chose to also watch this one all the way through. And I appreciate that very much. If you found it helpful, go ahead and leave a like. If you disagree, agree with me, go and leave a comment. Um, I do read them. I can't respond to all of them. And if you want to support what we do, there's some links in the description for that. Um, there's some stuff you can get, the hats, the stickers, all that sort of stuff. That's just sort of a, if you really like what we do, it helps to pay for all the things that help run live streams and um, weekly videos. So thank you guys for being here. I appreciate you. I'll talk to you later.